Well, now comes the, the time to introduce our keynote speaker. It's a great honor and great pleasure for me to introduce uh, President Felipe Calderon. Uh, Felipe Calderon, as you know, is a combination of many things. He's a very strong academic background, a political leader. He has been the head of uh, PAN. He has been Secretary of Energy and, of course, elected democratically and President of Mexico during six years. One of the elements that it's very clear about the, the record, especially in the, when he assumed the presidency of, of Mexico, was his willingness and decision to commit himself to democracy. That's a very important thing. He was a, definitely a, a, a great factor in advancing in the democratic process in Mexico. The second thing is courage and decision making. You should remember that when he became president of Mexico, he had to, to lead the country in, under difficult circumstances. The first, uh, during his term, we had the Lehman Brothers financial crisis. And thanks to sound macroeconomic policies and the willingness to, to do the right things, uh, you know, Mexico could be resilient to, to that process and start again a process of growth and advancement. Secondly, you will remember that the epidemic, the, what was the, the La Porcina, la, the, yeah, this wine uh, epidemic that was the close Mexico for, for, a, for a while. You know, those two elements uh, were very negative and obstacle to any government, but President Calderon and the team were able to, to confront that and, they, and, and, and succeed. And thirdly, I think that a very crucial element is the decision that he took during his government to take very seriously the issue of narco-traffic, narco a difficult fight, a very complicated fight, and of course those three things together made him a, a real leader. And going beyond the presidency, well, in the academic world, well recognized, and of course a good friend. And from the standpoint of CAF, I, I, would, I would like to say that when CAF started to to move from a justice a regional bank to a more regional bank, the first country outside the Andeans which became a, a member was Mexico in the, about 20 years ago. But it was during the turn, turn of, of President Calderon that we got a very substantial increment in capital and in fact it opened the door for a, a closer relationship between Mexico and, and CAF and in fact today we have a, a, a regional office in Mexico. And on the international sphere, I think two elements or three elements I would like to mention. The first one is uh, the insertion of Mexico in the world economy in, in a model of a realistic model for this new area, this new area in the world. And he was uh, during the, and I was present there during the meeting of the Rio group and was a very founding moment for the creation and the, of what is today's CELAC. There was the meeting in, 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 uh, in Cancun uh, and that opened the door for, for that initiative in Latin America. And the other one is uh, the, the Pacific Alliance, uh, which precisely during his tenure, uh, he was the one who, who pushed together with other presidents in, in the region to get to that uh, integration scheme. So with that, all these things, I'm very honored, very pleased to ask President Calderon to, to come here and give us a vision of Latin America. Muchas gracias y bienvenido. Huh? To, to CAF, um, to Inter-American Dialogue, and of course to OES, OES for this invitation. And it's a pleasure to me to talk 
with you. I would try to talk a little bit about the situation in Latin America, mainly in the economic side, and trying to explain what exactly is happening or has happened in our region. I will talk a little bit about the Mexican experience, and if we have time, maybe some challenges for the region. So let me start to show you this uh, uh, front page of The Economist some years ago. And we used to talk at that time about the decade of Latin America. We were really proud about what exactly was happening in our region. Um, we were not, uh, uh, we were nobody's backyard anymore at that time. And we were talking a lot about our promising economic growth in the region. And what happened in these years and exactly what was happening those years? We need to understand exactly that in order to avoid to make the same mistakes that we made in the past and try to get uh, lessons from the Latin American experience. One thing that happened is globalization and global economy. You can see that the performance of uh, the markets in this year, look at this, world exports. The exports in the world grew more in this century, in 13 years of this 21st century, than in half a century, last century. In this. So the economy, the expansion of the economy is clear and is accelerating. And it is over exactly the world trade in which the economy is, uh, is moving around the globe. And in this particular first decade of this century, which coincides with the so-called Latin American decade, something happened and it's related with economic growth and it's related with, in particular, world trade. And world trade is completely correlated with the performance of GDP at global level. You can see clearly, it's a fantastic graph for an economic students in the sense that that correlation looks like perfect. So the world trade is correlated with economic growth and that has an incredible impact in our region with an incredible windfall for a lot of economies, in particular for exporting commodities economies, as I will explain later. So basically, um, one more point, what could be the factor that explains this expansion of the exports in the first decade of this century? In my opinion, the key factor of that is the entrance of China to the World Trade Organization. But that changed the whole equations in the world. So let me go further with that. That implies an incredible benefit to some countries. Uh, um, roughly, let me say that I would try to understand the region, explaining there are two kinds of economies. One are the economics more related with Mercosur, and basically not only Mercosur, but also ALBA. Uh, and the other could be more open, more market-oriented economies, uh, more focus, for instance, in the Pacific Alliance we organized, as Enrique was saying, in our tenure. It was an incredible, good experience, I would say that. So you can see clearly the performance of the profile of the exports of Mercosur. Clearly, 70% of more of the Mercosur economies are commodities, commodity-oriented, which is crucial. Because the key factor in the last decade was the growth of the prices in commodities in the world. And mainly because China became to be a big purchaser, uh, big consumers of any kind of commodities from grain to oil to gold and everything. So that explains, for instance, the performance of economic growth of several of those economies more related with Mercosur. On the other hand, you can see the profile of the economies of Pacific Alliance, which is more manufactured oriented, in particular because Mexican economy. And that's implied a different economic performance in that there. Of course, and I anticipate one of my observation is, last decade, if the, eco if the prices of commodities lead the performance of the global economy, all those countries more oriented towards exporting commodities will, were incredible benefit from that. And that was the case exactly of Brazil and Argentina and Paraguay and others uh, raw materials uh, exported oriented countries. 
You can see uh, the same idea by basically the one economies are different from the others in terms of the profile that you can observe uh, there. Now, what happened in those years first? The, the, the relevant phenomenon is the increase in the prices of commodities, as I was saying. So you can see mainly metals, silver, gold, lead, increase it, their prices in an incredible manner. But also food, mainly palm oil, uh, uh, soja, or soya, as we say. We can see rice, sugar, corn, you can see anyway, oil, of course. And that is correlated on one side and the side of the demand side with the economic growth in China and, of course, the entrance of China to the World Trade Organization. China became an incredible engine for the economic growth of export oriented or a commodity oriented economics, exporting mainly in Latin America and other parts of the world. You can see an incredible trend starting in 2000, and in my opinion, that is correlated exactly with the new performance of the world, the prices, and that is increases in the real economy, but also the creation of a lot of bubbles in commodities and financial sector, and a lot of sectors, so even real estate sector, that was the prelude to the economic crisis in 2008, 2009. Now, what happened later? So the economy crashed, and then commodity prices started to go down, and even the performance of Chinese economy started to go down. So the point is, after 2009, the story of the economy at global level and the story of the economy of Latin America changed. And that is the reason why some countries are now suffering, for instance, recessions in Brazil, which is incredible. Two years or four years ago could be like impossible to believe that the Brazilian economy could be in recession. Very low increases in economic performance in other economies. And of course, that could have an impact in those economies. Look, again, a visual correlations between prices on commodities and Brazil's GDP. Clearly, the performance of those prices is determining the performance of the economy. Very similar case for Argentina. Um, at the end, what you can see is these economies and others in Latin America more oriented towards commodities that had an incredible good windfall in the last decade started to suffer after 2010, the decrease in raw materials, the decrease in food prices, the decrease in commodity prices. And my point is, if the future of Latin America needs to be reshaped in favor of better economic growth, needs to be less dependent on commodities and needs to be more oriented to aggregate value in the economies. Because all those economies that depends a lot in raw materials and commodities in the primary sector, even without these kind of movements in the prices, which is very common, commodity prices are very volatile. Even without that, just consider the part of the economic growth and economic performance. The economies that could apply more aggregated value to their products and services, will be benefit from the evolutions of the economy. Or in other words, the economies that depends more in primary sector and with less aggregated value will see the deterioration or the reductions in their terms of trade or exchange during the time. So in other words, whether you prefer to produce apples as a fruit or apples as a computer, and clearly the aggregated value implies that the kind of development you will have, you cannot depend all the time exporting or producing in, in private, in primary sector. And look this graph. Not only these obvious correlations between aggregated value and the level of development, but also the long-term trend of the price of commodities, believe it or not, is a negative trend. In other words, the terms 
of trade or the price of commodities in relative terms is decreasing in time. Of course, there are some peaks there. You can see one peak in the first world war, another in the second maybe, and very stable uh, performance even with negative slope. And again, that bubble related with the change of goal uh, parameter and the change of the monetary system and the old crisis with an incredible bubble in the 70s. But then a negative trend, and you have this, again, very important phenomenon, the entrance of China to WTO. And now, are we looking for another change with negative trends in the price of commodities? That is possible, and that explains the kind of uh, phenomenon we are observing in Latin America. But at the end, the lesson is the same. So countries' development is linked to the increase in the aggregate value of their economies. And in the long term, the terms of trade of commodity intensive economies will be deteriorated. So basically, that's my point. So that explains a lot uh, of the performance of the economies right now in Latin America. That explains a part why we cannot talk anymore, at least with so positive an optimism about the decade of Latin America. And we need to see how open are the economies in our region and how intensive they are related with commodities or secondary or tertiary sectors. You can see clear that Mexico, honestly, is a very open economy. Mexico suffers a lot due its link with the American economy. Um, it didn't uh, enjoy the increase on commodity prices last decade, but nevertheless it's open. You can see the average of the Pacific Alliance countries. You can see several categories. Countries really open to trade, but very dependent on commodities, which could be the case of Bolivia. Countries, uh, uh, on the contrary, or other countries dependent on trade, but not dependent, or open to trade, but not dependent on commodities, or dependent on commodities, but, but close, which is, could be the cases of some countries with Mercosur, uh, which is the case of Brazil, and uh, of course the case of Venezuela. Look at this. The lack of openness, the lack of uh, openness of Brazil could explain the lack of competitiveness of the Brazilian economy. And it's, again, very obvious that uh, you want to be very competitive. You need to compete. That's it. It's a, it's a rule for, for soccer championship, and it's a rule for economies, and it's a rule for anyone. Huh? Now. Look at the performance of the economies. One side, the Pacific Alliance, and the other is, again, this is the Pacific Alliance, more related with, uh, with the manufacturers. And this is the Mercosur, more related with, uh, um, uh, more related with uh, commodity, commodity products. Let me see the exports to the world. It's, it's, that graph really measure the openness of the, those economies, but well, there is my point anyway. Now you can see if we are saying that the, that openness explains a lot about the competitiveness of the economies, you can see that in the modern economies, competitiveness is a key issue in order to prosper and in order to be success. And now, if you take some index, you can see clearly in the Global Competitiveness Index, countries of the Pacific Alliance like Chile, Mexico, um, and Peru, Colombia, which are more open, they are more competitive as well. And countries uh, more related with the Mercosur are less in that sense. I'm talking about infrastructure is probably uh, is not so clear, but uh, could be in the long term the same. So again, open markets improves the competitiveness of the economies, and those countries with open markets and competitiveness could survive and could have more stable economic performance, even in the slowdown of the economic growth or the economic prices. So that's part of the, I will talk about the challenges, but if you allow me, let me, with these ideas, 
in mind, let me try to explain a little bit what we tried to do in Mexico on the economic side, despite the fact that we needed to face a lot of challenges, as Enrique was saying. Uh, just getting into the government, the economic crisis, the worst economic crisis ever, at least for the present, for living generations, and the age one and one outbreak, by the day we realized that we have a lethal and completely unknown new virus in Mexico City. Uh, there were more people killed by this new virus than the people killed today by Ebola in Africa. Uh, of course, finally, we, at that time, we had not any vaccines and we didn't know any cure, but finally we faced that. We have the recessions of the United States, the economy. I was seeing in my desk the figures of the economy. The economy was going down at a speed of 10% negative the first and the second quarter of 2009, two quarters in a row. So it was dramatic. Uh, we made a lot of changes, expanding public expenditure of more than 3% of GDP in that particular year. But at the same time, when we realized that we were passing the worst moment of that, we closed the deficit following a very old recipe, which is reduce your expenditures and increase your income, which is nothing new under the sun. We cut a lot of expenditures. We closed a very uh, inefficient uh, utility in Mexico City, uh, which cost to the budget around $5 billion a year. Uh, we increased taxes. Uh, lost a lot of popularity, but anyway, we, we do that. So let me see, let me explain to you what we did about competitiveness in the Mexican side. Besides those factors in order to deal with the crisis, and you want to explore this incredible experience related with the economic crisis, you can read my new book, <laughs> which is Los Retos Que Enfrentamos, The Challenges We Faced which is uh, probably not only in a Spanish version, but I think it's available in an electronic version, if I understand. No, some Amazon or something like that. Well, well, competitiveness. First, we realized that Mexico has a tremendous opportunity in terms of trade. When I was teaching, I like to say to my students that look at this, no, look at this map. Mexico is exactly in the middle of the world, so God bless us. No? So we have a tremendous opportunity everywhere. So even in the middle of the crisis, we went strategically, we, we bet on free trade. And actually after this very good moment, and I let me recognize again to Ambassador Carla Hills present here about the incredible achievement of free trade agreement. Mexico follow, and we follow the strategy of uh, celebrating free trade agreements, and now Mexican products have access to more than 44 countries free of tariffs, which implies more than 1 billion consumers in the world of Mexican products. And we follow that strategy, of course, with Latin America, and that's the idea beyond the Pacific Alliance we organize. More than that, I remember all those meetings of the G20, all those 20 leaders and presidents and prime ministers talking about we need to close the temptation of protectionism, we need to support the free trade agreements, we need to end the Doha round immediately, and the day after, 15 out of those 20 leaders raised tariffs and established more barriers to trade. We didn't so, we did the other way around, we reduced, even in the middle of the crisis, the tariffs, in particular for industry. So we went from more than 10% to roughly 4%, which implied an incredible strength to the competitiveness of the Mexican industry. And that was a key issue for, to support our strategy to focus uh, on the very specific areas of industry, automotive industry, electronic industry, 
uh, aerospace industry and older, they became quite competitive. Why? Because if you want to produce the best car in the world, you need to allow to GM or Ford Motor Company or Honda to get all the inputs from abroad, whatever they need, the brake system, the electronic system, whatever, if they are able to import and they find the right people manufacturing that, you will produce the best car in the world. And you will have the most successful automotive industry in the world. And that was roughly the case, and I will explain that. So we, we bet on free trade, we reduce tariffs, we follow with the free trade agreements. We invest a lot in infrastructure, again, because I like this graph so much. You, know? <laughs> you can see in gray the old net of roads and highways in Mexico, and you will see in red the new roads or the rebuild of roads in Mexico, modernizing. If, if one road has only seven meters, we wider to 11 meters and rebuilding all the carpet of that. So we build or rebuild in Mexico in six years more than 22,000 kilometers, which is more or less the distance between North Pole and South Pole. And with that, we boost the competitiveness of the economy again. Uh, look at this, I like this graph. This is the Baluarte Bridge. So between this column, the state of Sinaloa, and this column, the state of Durango, there are more than 500 meters, half a kilometer. And, and there are four lines in this bridge, in this highway. And between the bridge and the river, more or less over here, there are more than 400 meters, which is the highest bridge in its type in the world. And we got the Guinness record about that, so <laughs> I like it so much. So we build and rebuild infrastructure and roads more than the two sexenios before together, and almost the same than the three sexenios before in terms of roads. We deregulated the economy, reducing, for instance, time for open a business um, for almost 60 to only on less than 10. I remember that I instructed the secretary saying, please write down all the regulations, laws, and um, officials you have, and you consider those are needed for your work. But in three months, if you are not able to remember one of them, and you are not able to explain me what are the reasons for that regulation, we will erase that. And yes, I published in October 2010 a decree abolishing, nullifying 16,000 rules in Mexico, which imply more than 2,000 procedures, some of them obsolete. Actually, we organize a public context, or a context among the public, under this key question. What could be the most useless procedure in public <laughs> or in government? The useless. Uh, there were like 3,000 participants on that. It was incredible that we got a lot of information of that. The other, we changed a system in which the government had, by tradition, a budget to support uh, SMEs in Mexico, small and medium enterprises, giving a bit of the budget for each one. Of course, it was completely uh, impossible to satisfy the need of those companies, so we canceled that system. We increased the budget. We put that money not to provide small pieces to each one, but we put the money as a collateral in the banking system. So we started to guarantee loans to SMEs, probably 10%, 20%, fear loses, whatever. And with that, we multiply by six the amount of credit to SMEs in Mexico. And we established a program in which we committed the government to buy up 35% of total purchases from Mexican SMEs. So we increased that, the support. We multiply and unfold the budget for health services, and we passed the coverage in 2006 from 60 million people, 60 million Mexicans, sorry, to 106 million people covered by the public health insurance, which means that Mexico reached universal health coverage by first time ever.
106 out of 112 million people living in Mexico. Um, for that, beyond multiplying the budget for health services, we multiply the budget for infrastructure and we build 1,200 new hospitals or clinics in the country and rebuild 2,000 or 2,400 more, which implied to have the inf infrastructure to do so. It was an incredible achievement that unfortunately was not uh, uh, emphasized enough probably, but uh, was good for Mexico. And at the same time, we've invested a lot in people. So under the strategy to, we think in the other issue related with organized crime, among other things, there is a race between the state of the government and the criminals to look who is able to provide more opportunities for kids and for young people, the government or the criminals. So we started to provide opportunities for health services, for education, for jobs, and so on. And with that strategy, we started to build high, uh, high schools, for, for example, 1,100 new high schools and 140 new universities all of them public and tuition free universities, 140. But with that, we had some kind of collateral benefit related with the economy because we started graduating more engineers every year. And actually Mexico currently is graduating more than 100,000 engineers a year. More than 100,000, which implies more engineers than in Germany or the UK or Canada or Brazil or whatever. And that is providing a lot of opportunities for kids that is preventing immigration to US and is preventing the incorporation of those kids to criminality, but also that is increasing competitiveness in manufacturing sector in Mexico. Why? Because the companies are able to find the right people for their plants, automobile plants, aerospace plants, etc. So finally, some of the results in the macroeconomic side so we try to keep uh, order in public finances. We reduced the deficit and we left office with less than 1% of GDP in terms of public deficit. Actually, the following year, the plan was to reach zero deficit in Mexican public finances. Uh, in terms of public net debt, Mexico uh, was only 32, 33% of GDP in terms of public debt. You can see compare, you can see and compare for instance, the average of OECD could be like 66%. Uh, you have these countries in problems. You have the US, 82%, and so on. Mexico, only 33%. Actually, Hacienda, the Mexican Treasury, issued a bond in 2008, 2009 could be, Alejandro, which, the 100, 100 years bond is 10. A uh, 100 years bond at a rate of 6% or something like that, which is, was the longest ever for the region and only there was a Chinese bond of 100 years at a higher rate. But uh, we recovered the trust or the confidence for the markets. Uh, the, tr the nightmare of Latin America, the exchange rate crisis, we increased the foreign reserves until the point in which, when we left office, the foreign reserves in dollars were 2.5 times the total external debt of the Mexican government. So there was a very solid base for stable performance of the Mexican macroeconomic. But talking about competitiveness, we move in the, for instance, doing business index, we moved from the place 73, according to the World Bank, in 2006, to the place 53 in 2012, when we left. Other related global services location index, we again increase our qualifications uh, from 5.2 to 5.7. Uh, look at this, in terms of manufacturing, Mexico now is exporting more than 60% of the total manufactured products in Latin America and Caribbean region. So we are exporting, in other words, more manufactured products than the rest of Latin American and Caribbean countries, including Brazil, altogether. 
uh, other is that uh, I like this so much. When I took office, Mexico was the ninth largest exporter of vehicles in the world. When I left office, Mexico surpassed in these years the United Kingdom, the United States, Spain, and other countries. And now we are the fourth largest exporter of vehicles in the world and growing. So that is providing an incredible strength to the Mexican economy in these very difficult times. We multiply by far the number of jobs we lost during the terrible economic crisis. The economy went down almost 6% negative. And we multiply the formal almost 2 million jobs in three years in the formal sector in Mexico. And finally, the performance of the economy went stronger and it accumulated an expansion of more than 16% of the crisis from 2010, basically three years, and a rate on average 4.2%. And that coin, this is the, the front page of The Economist. I don't like this sombrero exactly, but this is very British version, but anyway. No? <laughs> But you can see the front page of The Economist in November 2012, a little bit before I left office, and people started to talk about the rise of Mexico and the same of the Mexico's comeback of the IMF, and Mexican miracle from Forbes, and so on. So that's the Mexican experience related with this, and uh, finally some challenges for Latin America in order to reshape and retake the issue of this conference. You allow me, Enrique. Well, one is, these are, in my opinion, the challenges of the region. One is democracy and rule of law, which is the most important. I believe that the big mistake we have in our region is the lack of rule of law. And we need to understand that if we want to be developed countries one day, we need to enforce the law, and we need to transform our societies and our states in rule of law states. Robert Barrow made, like 15 years ago, a quite interesting report uh, measuring the performance of the economies in a very long time series with a sample of more than 100 countries, 150 probably. And what could be the correlation between rule of law and economic growth? And he discovered that the, the, he established like seven categories or dummy variables to explain the level of uh, rule of law, or the level of enforcement. Let me assume that Switzerland could be category one, and some Somalia, for instance, could be category seven. So the difference between the countries number one and the countries number seven was almost 3.5% of GDP of growth a year, yearly. 3.5% a year is the difference in the economic performance of the societies related if they apply the law or not with different levels, of course. In my opinion, for developing countries, it is crucial, it is crucial to transform the institutional framework to apply the law to have certainty, which is the most important factor for investment and for creation of jobs and economic growth. Investment in human capital, we need to bet forming students, in particular engineers and technicians, and we need to improve the quality of education. Investment in infrastructure, you can see, I don't like to use the expression human capital and physical capital. But anyway, they take the human value, let me say that, and physical capital infrastructure, which is key, to promote and accelerate structural change through structural reforms, which Mexico now is making strong and bold, structural reforms that is going to be very good for the future. And finally, a commitment with sustainable development. Quickly. The environment in Latin America, the electoral processes, the index. So we were talking a little bit about Cuba some minutes ago. And now Venezuela is clearly deteriorating its quality in terms, uh, and it's, I, I, I want to make an alarm call for what is happening in Venezuela right now. We cannot see like that what is happening there. The society is suffering, and there is a deteriorating process in the quality of democracy and human rights, and that is going to affect the entire region, let alone what is happening in Cuba, 
but we can do something as international community. OAS can do, I must do something, uh, respectfully saying, my dear <laughs> Secretary General, I think it's time to react and wake up about what is happening in our region because we're losing our freedom and our liberties, no? Because things cannot be like always in that sense. Uh, there will be elections in the region. Uh, one are already passed, Juan Manuel Santos, a good friend, won again, and that's good. Ambassador, congratulations for that in this year. Uh, we had elections in El Salvador, we had elections in Panama, and I will say hello to my good friends, Martin Torrijos, former president of Panama. And there will be elections in Brazil. What is going to happen in Brazil? Those are the opinion polls last week. So Dilma is still ahead in the first round, but Marina looks like could defeat Dilma in the second round. And that could imply a dramatic change in the correlation of forces in the region in several, with several consequences. You would see that uh, well, Marina is a former uh, sustainable ministry in Brazilian government. Some people could be afraid of that. I know that my real passion is sustainable development and environmental issues. And I'm heading, I'm chairing now the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. And I will present a report in September 16. And I will demonstrate that it's possible to tackle climate change and at the same time to have economic growth. That Marina is saying exactly that in her campaign. But anyway, that's the point. That, what could be the changes in the region? If you read, and it's, of course, you can, I can make a lot of mistakes, but I'm reading, trying to read carefully the economic program. If that situation happened, there will be possible, possible an economic change in the traditional protectionist trend of the Brazilian government. That could imply a change in the right direction. That could allow Brazil to recover its competitiveness. And that could recover in the right directions the economic growth in the whole region. But let's say, let's see what the Brazilian people decide, but uh, we need to put an eye in this particular election. And of course, it could have repercussions in the world region in political terms as well, as long the source of legitimacy for a lot of those regimes, believe it or not, is the relationship with Brazil and its government. I don't say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the other point related with that is ours is the most violent region in the world. And we need to address that. So you can see, of course, well, the most violent in Southern Africa, but uh, South America, Central America, and the Mexican part of North America would say it's the most violent region, the, almost the most violent region in the world. And that's a factor that is lagging our development. It's affecting the development, economic development of the region. We need to address that. Again, it's related with rule of law. It's related with the strategies we put in place, uh, triple the strategy, combat and face the criminals, rebuild um, the law enforcement agencies and institutions, some of them from the bottom, and rebuild the social fabric. We can talk about later, but uh, it's the same related country by country. Even though Mexico has a real problem, you can see there, the rate of homicides per thousand population, it's incredibly high in the region. So this part of the graph implies a terrible uh, problem for our economies and the welfare of our people. Again, you can see the rule of law index, the World Justice Project made this. Some, I'm sorry, some countries are passing the, the test. Uruguay, Chile, um, Brazil is over here. But among the worst performance, there are a lot of Latin American countries. So this is an issue that we need to address and give it the importance it has. And finally, my remark is, at the very end, I think that Latin America is again 
having a battle between the past and the future. The past, in economic terms, is protectionism, is expropriations, is nationalism. And that past is failing. It's failing now, and we can see the performance of the economies, even the most uh, moderated economies. Protectionism is not working anymore. The future in terms of economy is market, private investment, certainty. The past in terms of politics is authoritarianism, lack of democracy, lack of rule of law, and lack of human rights. And the future is, on the contrary, democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And we need to bet and we need to act for the future of Latin America. And then, if we got it, if we bet in the right direction for the future, for democracy, for market, for human rights, for rule of law, there will be, this time, there will be the real decade of Latin America, and there will be a lot of those Latin American decades. So thank you very much, and I will be open for your comments. Well, well th thank you very much, uh, Felipe. This was a tremendous presentation, very comprehensive, very challenging. In fact, uh, I think that you went on all the things that will be discussed uh, in these two days. It's a big challenge for the panelist because he has put a very high stick there. And, um, of course, there are many issues that I'm sure that the panels will agree on many things, disagree on others, but thank you very much. I think you did a, a great job. And precisely, I think, on the economic side, it's very crucial. The main message is they're very strong how to move from what is called comparative advantage in the traditional sense to competitive advantage. And second thing that you emphasize very much is the importance of democracy, institutions, and the rule of law. So, uh, thank you very much. If there is a question, two questions can be done. One, one and two, but that's all. You, one. Okay. And the second question? No second question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. La pregunta? There's a question? Okay. okay. So we have two questions, one on income distribution. But it, well, but it's another crucial problem. You're right. Uh, I'm sorry for that. I didn't mention that. But the point is, the way in which you can reduce the gap between rich and poor is by providing opportunities, equal opportunities for all, in particular in education, health services, and public services in general. Uh, and that's the way to do so. And actually, even in the middle of the crisis, the experience I comment in my book is, even though the economy went down dramatically, we put a lot, put in place a lot of contracyclical measures, 
and increase the social protection or the protection of the social net of the poorest people. Basically, we almost duply the budget for Oportunidades, which is the origin, origin of this conditional cash transfer, Bolsa Familia and others. The beginning was Progresa Oportunidades in Mexico. We increase not only the number of families receiving the support, increasing from 5 million to 6.5 million families, almost one, four, one third of the population. And we increase the average of each family was receiving. We increase Seguro Popular in a very important manner at those years. And with that, even though the impact of the crisis with a recession of 6%, and now the INEC is fixing the figures, but the point is there was incredible contraction of the economy. Most of the impact was in the middle and upper levels. In such a way that the Gini coefficient in Mexico even reduced from 2008 to 2010. No, inequality reduced. Not enough, of course. Um, my point is the same. My conclusion is we need to increase. Uh, there was a factor that was out of our hands, unfortunately, and maybe we, need, we needed to deal better with that. It was exactly the price of commodities. When I took office, the second problem I had, the first problem was to, to get the office, no? <laughs> the rich. <laughs> to make my outer office was the first problem. But the second was the price of the tortilla. Mm. Well, because the price of the tortilla went up from four pesos a kilo to nine pesos. And you consider that Mexico is a country in which we, the Mexican families, consume almost one kilo per day on average, per family, one kilo. So you can see the political and economic problem I had. Actually, I think, that's another topic for discussion, but. The Arab Spring was due, not exactly Twitter and Facebook and so on, that's so fancy for journalists, but it was because the price of wheat and bread and gasoline went up in the north of Africa. And you can see clearly that the prices went probably twice, six months before the first rebellion in Egypt in that year. That's interesting. So the food is a political question. So the other, well, we deal with that, but the other problem is food prices impact a lot the level of poverty. Actually, the traditional way to measure poverty is a coefficient, uh, or it's a co uh, uh, ratio. It's a ratio between uh, the income of the people on the top and the price of a basket on the bottom. Even though you increase the income, even you, though you can do a lot of things for the benefits of the people, if you increase the denominator, you will reduce or you will increase the number of poverty or the size of poverty. So that's the reason why we need to measure in a different way. Um, the new measure, according to new parameters in the world, are not only the, the income over a basket of, of food, but mainly is how you can fill the necessities of the people, housing, health services, education, income, and food, and so on. So uh, under other measures could be different, but the point is inequality could, redu could reduce even more if we had not that problem related with food prices. All the consequences of this bubble on commodities, real or financial or both, is the impact it has in poverty in the world, including Mexico. The in the Horn of Africa, for instance, we started to show again incredible scenes that we didn't see since 30 years ago, uh, the poverty in several parts. But uh, we need to address opportunity. I think the right thing to do that is universal health coverage in terms of health, universal access for education, increasing opportunities for kids. One, the day we can provide to the kid the equal opportunity for a kid coming from poorest family to the for to get quality in his or her education to the kid coming from the richest family that could be the beginning of the reduction of poverty and inequality and the other is related that you can have a lot of resources uh, have a this difference between uh, advantages competitive advantages and comparative advantages but even though you have all the oil you can have, which is the case, for instance, in Ecuador, or the case in Mexico, 
If you are not able to address the economy and provide the right economic incentives, you will fail probably. You can increase the benefit of the people, but uh, in the long term, the key issues for development are not exactly in your raw materials, or not exactly in your natural resources. And I admire, for instance, and I conclude, I'm sorry, Enrique, but the case of uh, Singapore. I remember one of our classmates at uh, Kennedy School several years ago, we were discussing about the bad luck of Mexico to be so close to the United States, following this expression of Porfirio Diaz saying, poor Mexico, so, so far from God, so close to the United States, no? <laughs> Um, finally, one of them asked us to the Mexican, we were very passionate about that, and saying, well, how many kilometers you say that you share with border with the United States? 3,000 kilometers. Okay. We will pay anything in order to have only 300 meters of border with the United States. <laughs> and this guy came from Singapore. And he started to talk about the history of Singapore. And uh, he told us, you know, the independence of Singapore was declared upon us and against us. No? The day that the independence was declared, uh, the president of minister uh, went to the TV and crying, and crying, was explaining to the people that Singapore was independent. <laughs> because Singapore had not no. nothing let alone oil, nothing, even drinking water, they had not at that time. And they now became an incredible miracle. It was not a question of natural resources, it was a question of rule of law, it was a question of discipline, it was a question of hard work, and that is exactly the real resources that we, the Latin American countries, will aspire to have in the future. So thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you.